at the cost of this call, press nine now. What was that? Alright, Sean, do the Star Wars, ready? No, you do it. <laughs> do it. I'll do it. Star Wars! <laughs> It was like two years ago, so I was 19. I first tried it when I was 17 years old. I was 19 when I first started using heroin. Um, I started using drugs right around 14 years old. I was 18 or so when I started. This is an, obviously an increasing problem um, in our state and around the country. Over the last several years, um, it's come to the attention of a lot of the media. Um, over the last probably five to ten years is when it's really become a problem. Um, and it's multifactorial why this has happened, but it's actually become such a, a huge e epidemic at this point that more people die of opiate overdoses every year than die in car crashes, which we're talking thousands and thousands of people. Uh, we had actually just opened an office in Arkansas, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, and uh, we were opening an office just like normal, and Jeff came out from California like he did a lot as an owner, and he was assisting us in the open, just, you know, just helping out and giving me, you know, support as a manager, and he had indicated that he wanted to kind of be left alone that day. Um, I thought he was just tired or, you know, whatever. He was my boss. I didn't question him. Um... We went out and it was a Saturday evening, went out with some guys from work and we came back to the corporate housing where we had been staying and still hadn't heard from Jeff all day and I found it a little odd that I didn't hear from him. So I went and checked on him where he was sleeping and that's when I discovered his body. Um, he had been laying there all day, uh, they said about 12 hours. Um, he still had the, um, he basically had a bad hit of heroin and I found him dead where he was, you know, with the needle still in his arm. I remember an encounter I had with an addict that still weighs down on my conscience. I got a phone call from a regular client. We met up. I sold her whatever it was she was buying. And right before I go about my business, she told me that she, that she just found out she was pregnant. And I found it crazy how she knew she was carrying a baby and she still, she still had it in her to get high and do drugs. But who am I to judge to each his own? That seat is used for airway, generally. Um, if you have to use the bag valve mask to breathe for the patient, you'd be sitting in that seat. Your oxygen would drop from the ceiling and come right down to the patient. But generally, on a regular basis, you would work up from this, this bench right here. Yeah, I worked for the town of Machai as public works director for 12 years. and. We get down through town, you know, every Monday morning and Friday afternoon, and, you know, pick trash up, and we'd find needles around, um, garbage cans. Um, we'd even have the high school kids. Um, they do community service days, and we'd have to give them gloves to put on their hands, and if they found needles, to let us know um, and tell them not to touch them. There's been a number of folks who I've lost who didn't even get to the hospital. Um, the the thing about opiate overdoses is that <clears throat> if they get here and they are still alive, the medication that we can give, you guys might have heard about this, is called Narcan. And increasingly it's available from a pharmacist. You don't even have to have a prescription for it. It's for family members to use. EMS providers carry this stuff now. It's just to spray up your nose. Uh, families can use them. A lot of police and EMS carry this medication now. 
But what this medication does, it, it's a very fast-acting drug that basically rips the opioid off of the opioid receptor that's in your brain, tears it off, and blocks it so that opiate can't get onto that receptor again. We have two, it comes two milligrams to a can, to a syringe. We don't give it all at once. Um, they can, can become very violent when you take away that high. Um, they, they're giving out home NACAN, some agencies, which is a very, very high dose, and they're violent almost every time. Severe, severely violent when they use that. We do 0.5 milligrams at a time in the nostril. They forget to breathe and they just stop breathing, no oxygen to the brain and they end up dying from it. It has saved many lives, but it's not a miracle drug. Uh, there are times that you will give somebody Narcan in the morning and you're back later in the day to do it again. It's, it's not a, and it will not save everybody. It, it, if they're just, if it, you can be too late like you can be with anything else. And if you're too late, NACAN isn't going to do anything. Why? Um, just isolation and just, you know, um, just didn't want to feel anything. I went through an early divorce with my parents, so you know I was pretty angry. So I just thought, you know, using drugs and drinking was the way out. But it's it's definitely not. It's it's nothing good comes out of it. Um, I guess for me it was just trying to to fit in. I mean it was around. I started drinking when I was young and smoking pot, and that led to using pills, and then. From pills, it led to using heroin. I mean, I guess for me, it was just trying to fit in. I've put a lot of thought into that in the past. Uh, and I would have to say the, the biggest reason I started was to fit in, you know, peer pressure, being, you know, be one of the guys. And that's, that's why I started using. Probably you've heard already friends and family and background like my family has a lot of drug history and my friends also have a lot of drug history so when you when you're influenced by so many people you kind of you kind of tend to follow them Camden New Jersey uh, you can just pretty much go on the street and buy it there uh, I'm local. I'm right from the area, so I got it right here. Uh, friends, uh, you know, it's the friends that I used with, uh, they had. Uh, I most of my friends are older friends, so they, you know, they. It was always easy for them to get what I wanted. When you first start out, you don't you don't go looking for the stuff. The stuff kind of finds you, and it's it's really up to you to make that decision whether or not you're going to do it or you're going to walk away from it. And the best thing to do is to walk away, no doubt about it. Uh, about six weeks ago, um, surrendered my, you know, surrendered my life to, to the Lord, Jesus Christ. Nothing good can come out of it. It's either you're going to either be in the ground or you'll be in prison, and that's the bottom line. There's, I mean, there's no. There's nothing good about it. I stopped 90, yeah, 90 days ago. I, I just realized that, you know, I, I, I was broken. I was, I was in a bad place. You know, I'd, I'd hurt everyone around me, everyone close, my whole family. I had no friends left. Just living in a rundown place. And uh, a guy offered me help and and I took it, and it, it, brought, it led me here. It led me to, to Jesus. I mean, I, it's the only thing that would have saved my life. It would be six months, to, six months and three days, it would be six months. <laughs> it was time. It was, I was going to die. I, I was, 
I being a well, twenty years using drugs, it's I don't know how common it is for a twenty year heroin addict to get a second chance like I've been given. Like two weeks ago. So it's been quite a road trying to get to you. Yeah. When you're in the middle of that kind of lifestyle, you can slowly see yourself just dying or losing everything that you love, everything that you want to do in life slowly just starts to be taken away from you. Like I said, I'm a, you know, I'm a lifelong drug addict. I've been to prison twice and uh, it's just, it's not, it's no good, it's not good at all. And um, I'm, I really shouldn't even be here talking to you people or making this uh, video. I should be in the ground, but by the grace of God, I am sitting here talking to you people, which I think is pretty awesome. You have to say to a team, <laughs> don't. <laughs> it, uh, from a very young age, it completely ruined my life. Uh, I was constantly sick unless I had money, you know, and most of the time I didn't have money because I already spent it the day before. Uh, there's just so much baggage comes with it. It's, it's, it's just not worth it. It will ruin your life, guaranteed. It's not a question of if, it's a question of, you know, when. It sounds all fun, just like when I started it, you know, everybody said how fun and cool it was, but it was far from it. I mean, a lot of sickness come with it being sick and I mean stealing and robbing and I mean you just you're like a hurricane everywhere you go. I mean it's just destruction everywhere you go. I mean it hurt. I lost my family, all my friends, you know. I mean it just it wasn't worth it in the long run. When you hear your friends talking about like, yeah, let's go have fun, let's go party, let's do this, it's not fun. It's not partying. It's it's you're really just destroying yourself. So if I were to tell anybody to, to do anything or to not do anything, I would tell them to just stay away from the drugs, stay away from the party scene. If you're already involved in that and you know a lot of your friends are about going out and having fun, drinking, doing drugs, find a new group of friends because they're not the people that you want to be with. They aren't. You're not going to have a life if you keep doing it. I just tell myself not to do drugs and that I can die from them. And it was, it was go to jail, uh, get better or die. Just had enough of it. I had a friend pass away, and you know, he was my neighbor for like six years. You know, I could look out my kitchen window and see his. I mean, his house was literally 20 feet away from mine, and he died at the age of 30. So, it was just everything around me just crumbling pretty much. I mean, I've made good money my whole life, and to really have nothing once winter hit, it's it's hard to live in Washington County. I mean, you really have to pinch your pennies just to make it by. And, well, uh, like I said, uh, I went to Penn Bay in Rockland. And I was only there like 10 days. Came off everything, cold turkey. And that, like I said, they pumped me full of antidepressants and stuff like that. But that just wasn't cutting it for me. You know, 
felt like a roller coaster ride. Then I refused the methadone treatment just because I've seen numerous people. And, and, but the sparks and treatment, I was in that, geez, probably 10 years. And they wean you down, but I don't know. She has had to stop taking it for a while. Then, yeah, you know, that's how I wean myself off. It kind of sneaks up on you. It didn't even realize you had a habit. Then, when you start going to work, and you just spend pretty much what you made that day. I mean, that you're not even living. And you find out who your friends are. Yeah. Um, my name is Amanda Smith. I am a full-time student in the Psychology and Community Studies program. I have minors in counseling and substance abuse services, and I'm going for my mental health rehabilitation technician certification. And I'm getting ready to apply for my master's. Um, I'd like to be a licensed alcohol and drug counselor and a licensed clinical social worker um, to be able to help some other people in the community. Um, I came back to school because I wanted to be an addiction specialist. I wanted to help others get through the process of addiction that I was fortunate enough to get through. Um, not everybody is that fortunate. And I know personally, I ended up going through a lot of counselors um, in my journey. Um, I'm sober 12 years. Um, but a lot of them didn't connect with me. Um, the couple that did, it was because they had their own journeys. They had been through what I had been through. Um, I knew I couldn't get away with anything um, because they've been through it too. Um, so giving back to the community, that was, that was the big thing. I was tired of watching my community members die. I was 18 or so when I started, um, mostly because I just wanted to fit in. Um, you see it's a common trend when it comes to addiction. And um, it started out okay. It wasn't super fun at first, but it got um, really bad really quick. And once you get hooked and your body gets addicted, it's not fun at all. And it became just about maintaining um, so that I wasn't sick every day. And it was a miserable experience, to be honest. Um, and then I had the town, you know, I grew up in, the friends that I grew, grew up with, um, you know, pointing their finger at me, and she's just a drug addict, and, um, you know, look what she's become, and it, it makes you want to give up. Um, and it makes it even harder, you know, to reach out. Um, but, you know, I had a, a couple periods where I would clean up for a little bit, um, in one of those periods, I had my daughter, um, and after she was born, I ended up getting back into it. And um, I just, I didn't want to raise kids in that environment. You know, I'd grown up around it. I had a father that battled addiction. My name is Justin Henderson. Um, I'm a junior at University of Maine at Machias. Um, I'm 20 years old. Uh, I went through the foster care system at a young age. I have never been personally addicted to any substances. Um, I came from a very substance abusive family um, before I was sent into the foster care system. Um, many different types of addiction were present and it changed the people I knew. Uh, my parents, um, family members in general, all of which would change while they were under the influence of addiction, addictive substances. Um, so, I mean, it got to the point of verbal, physical abuse on me and my other family members, um, and to the point of, after multiple occasions of law enforcement coming in and trying to assess the situation, they ended up removing me and my brothers from the home and setting us into foster care, which 
you know, then in, through foster care, um, there was less substance abuse, and then I was later on adopted by a non-substance family. But I saw a lot of things that I shouldn't have when it comes to my family, my friends, and I didn't want to bring my kids up in that. Um, the process of getting clean wasn't easy. Um, they had just kind of started Suboxone programs back then, and the waiting lists were so long because doctors could only see so many patients, and there was barely any doctors. So I bought um, them off the streets for a year because I didn't want to use um, pain, you know, pain pills. Oxycontins was my drug of choice. Um, and then finally the doctor called and said that I had come up on the list and that I could have an appointment. I worked hard, but it was not easy. Um, I got really depressed because I was a very social person. And when you cut everybody out of your life, um, it becomes really, really hard and you feel really, really alone. Um, and I didn't know if I was going to get out of it at, you know, at some points. Um, but it was a counselor that I connected with who also had a past, a history, but came out of it and made her life better um, that told me that I'd probably make a really good drug and alcohol counselor. Um, being around it so much, I had a decent knowledge of what goes on. And that's where I am now. I'm, I'm towards the end of my undergraduate. I graduate in the spring. Um, getting ready to hopefully get my master's and um, so I can start helping others. Um, and, you know, if I can help one person like that one counselor helped me, it's all worth it. Any kind of treatment that just suits them, so basically whatever works. Um, it's a really hard period for a lot of kids at that age. And, um, you know, that's when my self-esteem really crashed. And um, I think that's the reason why I was so susceptible to it. I, I just, like I said, I wanted to fit in. I wanted people to like me. I didn't care what I did as long as I felt like I was fitting in. I was part of the group. Um, so y you don't have to do that. Uh, you don't have to say yes because you're afraid to say no. Um, yeah, um, for my senior project, me and two other um, girls um, that I was in school here with that have graduated both since, uh, Sandy Alby and Shannon Olson, um, got together um, and we just wanted to do something um, to help the community around addiction. The documentary, um, we named it Rural Dirt. Um, the substance abuse epidemic in rural America. Um, rural dirt came up, uh, rural of course, because our area of focus was here in Washington County, which is a very rural, rural area. Um, and then dirt is the street name for heroin. We put our hearts into it and we tried our best. We did our showing last May and the turnout was actually pretty good. Well, I started in junior high. Um, uh, about sixth or seventh grade, uh, and it was an instant love affair for me. I, I just automatically, you know, loved everything about it, and it took over my life for the next twelve years. Uh, well, it was actually an intervention with the law. Um, <laughs> I was uh, I was arrested and, and charged with two felony uh, charges, um, and I was admitted into the Washington County Drug Court. And from there, I was able to get treatment and uh, and go to meetings and and get the help that I needed, the structure that I needed. And at the same time, I was ready. I, I was I was ready to change my life, and I was ready to do something different. Um, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. Honestly, the uh, AA and NA meetings uh, that was a wonderful help for me. I, I instantly got a sponsor. 
uh, somebody that I could I could talk to and, and go over my problems with as well as uh, drug court. I had a wonderful uh, treatment provider that really taught me how to live, how to change my brain, change change everything that I that I was doing into something positive, and uh, and that was huge for me. I did I did the methadone uh, treatment before. Um, I was on methadone uh, for two and a half years. I don't consider that for me. It, it did not help me because I, I abused that. So um, I, it goes back to you know wanting to change, wanting to do something different. But I was just a zombie for two and a half years on that stuff. So um, I didn't consider it helping me. Well, I've been clean and sober now for just over seven years. Um, I'm the store manager here at at, uh, at the Shell station, but. Uh, I sponsor people. I, I, I try and help people. Um, I try and talk with kids, uh, you know, about drugs and alcohol, what it can do, where it can lead. Um, I organize forums, and I'm on different committees and, and that type of thing. Anything, uh, my wife and I are both in, in recovery, and anything that we can do to try and help somebody recover is is just, you know, is number one in our book. So, and anything, uh, any entity, any any person that is willing to help an alcoholic or a drug addict get clean uh, is amazing. And I will promote them to the nth degree. So. My name is Paul Chogarello, uh, former heroin junkie, current director of Arise Addiction Recovery. I'm here to uh, say with total confidence that God heals men and women from addiction. Uh, my name is Paul Trovarello. I'm the founder of Arise as well as the director of the men's home. So Arise is, um, it's many things. Um, what it started out as was an addiction recovery meeting mm -hmm. in Machias where we originally met on Monday nights, which still goes on. It's been a year and a half now. Um, but that has blossomed into five meetings locally on different nights of the week. Um, we've also, uh, a year ago, about got the opportunity to open a RISE Men's Residential Discipleship Program. And so what we're standing in right now is two weeks away from becoming Arise Woman's Residential Discipleship Program. By that I mean it's um, a program for men and women to come into uh, with drug and alcohol and other addiction issues and long term, nine months long, and they get discipled. We're a, a faith-based organization, a Christian organization, which means that we teach freedom from addiction of all kinds through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's how I got set free. You know, I was a heroin addict for 17 years. Born and raised in New Jersey, and uh, there's no doubt in my mind or my family's mind that I was going to die a heroin addict. And uh, God had a different plan in mind. And I ended up in Maine three years ago. I came to a, a program just like Arise, different name. It's called Seven Oaks Training Center. It's a year-long program, and um, I learned more than just sobriety there. I learned how to be a man. I learned how to be responsible, how to be a dad, take care of my, my kids. I, had two, I have two daughters. I learned how to be a good friend, how to be a productive member of society, how to work an eight-hour job and not like go in my car and like take too many breaks, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Stuff like that, all stuff that addiction had robbed me of. And uh, you know, all the while, I'm growing in my relationship with Jesus. And like the Jesus that I was taught as I was growing up was the real passive Jesus with the long hair, the slippers, the sandals, mm -hmm. never making any waves. That's the Jesus I was introduced to as a boy as a lot of people are. And as I spend time studying the Bible, that is not Jesus at all. Jesus is very confrontational, right? He's in your face. He defends the truth. And, you know, very strong yet, you know, controlled, which is meekness. 
And I fell in love, really, realistically, with Jesus. And that change forever changed my life. You know, what we see here all of a rise, you know, there's five addiction recovery meetings. There's, we're standing in a woman's home. There, this is, will be the only residential woman's drug and alcohol program in Washington County. Uh, this over here is gonna be a sectional couch, which is gonna sit right here, kinda go like that. And in the corner right there on a mount is gonna be a flat screen TV. And so the second floor was built as a bedroom for the ladies. This is where the bedroom is going to be. Um, so we're going to be do single beds. There's going to be four single beds here, and then three single beds here. This sink is, was put in. It's a double sink. Um, there's going to be a vanity mirror that sits here, and a vanity light with four bulbs that go right there. We currently, at the men's house, have the only residential men's program in Washington County. All of this is funded by people, by people like you, by the church. You know what I mean? We get no funding from the government, none, because we're a Christian organization. Mm -hmm. So the government doesn't help us, nor do we ask for their help, because if you, you know, the government did kick money, you know, they'd have a say in how you ran the program, and we don't want that. And that's how it started from the beginning. We, I came out here, spent some time out here visiting a year and a half ago. And the pastor of Machias Christian Fellowship, his name is Aaron Dudley. He has become my closest friend. He has an addiction background himself. And I was visiting here and he asked me if I wanted to go out to dinner with a young man from Machias, Port Maine. Local kid, fisherman, just got out of a rehab in Florida. And as we sat down with this young man, we asked him, hey, how do you plan to stay clean? You know, I have a, an addiction past. How do you plan to stay clean? You're in the same town you got high in, you know? It's not going to be easy. And he started to tell us, give us this regiment of, you know, meeting on this night over here, meeting on this night over there, you know, meetings, meetings, meetings. And then he looked at us and he said, I'd like to attend your addiction recovery meeting. When is it? And so... Aaron and I looked at each other, not having a meeting. We were like, it's Monday. This is the first one. You should be there. And that was the very first Arise Addiction Recovery meeting. That was a year and a half ago. You know, now we're two facilities into it, five meetings locally. We started a meeting inside Washington County Jail where we go every Tuesday night. We bring the Arise meeting to them that are incarcerated. We know we're not the only show in town so we also drive people to other rehabs and you know if you're Jewish or you're a Muslim I wouldn't turn them away you know I drive them to another program and I've done that I've sent people to Michigan to rehab you know where we have these two guys are in the work phase of the program the program is broken up into three phases phase one is a probationary phase which is 30 days Phase two is what we call basic program, it's four months long. In basic program, you make a phone call home on Sunday. In the basic program, you do what you, know, we, you would think of as community service work. And then you do everything as a group. And then into your fifth month, you would enter into the third phase, which is a work phase where you get a job. My name is Dr. Kathleen London. I'm a family medicine physician. I grew up in New York City. I did my training. I went to Brown undergrad, did my pre-meds at Stanford, went to Yale for medical school and residency out in Oregon. Worked in the Boston area and New York City before moving up here. Um, I'm a scientist, so I tend to go with science. Opioid addiction has a very high recidivism rate, but I'm gonna go with science. So I use medication assisted, which means the, so the three forms of medication assisted that we currently have um, are methadone, suboxone, and Vivitrol. Um, I don't do methadone in my office. I have been medical director at methadone clinics. So methadone and suboxone 
uh, or buprenorphine are medications that bind to the opioid receptors. So they, f they flood them and bind to them, creating a, um, uh, blocking them so that those cravings stop and that, that dope sickness that people feel goes away. Suboxone has got the buprenorphine, which binds to the receptor. It also has an opioid blocker in addition, so that if somebody does use, despite that, it's going to block the action of any opioid. I'm pretty strict in, in my office. We do urine drug screens every time they're witnessed. Um, we pull people in for counts this week. In fact, seven people got booted um, out of 30. Um, so it, it's a program for adults. It's an outpatient and office-based program, which is a little different than what we call outpatient. So methadone clinics allow a little more, I'll say, leeway while people are sort of finding their way into treatment. Um, I don't. So in the U.S., according to, so the last stats we have are from 2014. ASAM has that 21.4, I think it is, million um, people are addicted to opioids. And of that, um, something at the time, from 2014, at least 1.3 million had experienced an overdose at some point. Um, doesn't mean that they all died from that. Because we're dealing both with heroin and we're dealing with pharmaceuticals. And that's the issue. A lot of it's turning. What I've seen more since I've moved up here is much more heroin use. It's cheaper. I had no idea what I was walking into. And what I saw time and time again were 15, what, what people told me, what the, the young people, the 20-something said to me is, well, when I was 15, it was easier to find oxy than, than pot in Lubeck, in Jonesport, in all these towns. And I'm like, you're, you're kidding. I think it's a multi-source. I think some of it's coming from Canada. Um, I think, so, I mean, we know that like the carfentanil that's in the heroin is coming from China. So clearly things are leaking through other places. The fentanyl that's been in the heroin comes from Mexico. So things are crossing borders all over the place. So the medications that we use when we're doing medication-assisted treatment are trying to go directly to these opioid receptors in the brain. What we know about was different in opioid addiction from other addictions is that opioids change the brain. Some of that seems to be permanent. Um, so for some, and this isn't necessarily true of all opioid addicts, for some, they may be on medication the rest of their life. So. It, you have to look at what was someone's pattern before. I have one woman who is, she's a small child, she's a single mother. When she was using, she was with a heroin dealer, so she doesn't even know how much she used a day, but it was a lot. So the chances of her ever coming off of medication is low. The hardest part, I think, for those of us who are dealing with addicts, whether you're a faith-based program or a physician or a counselor, is the lying that goes with it, um, because there's a lot of it. The drug companies did push it quite a bit. Um, not to me. I was not in any circumstances where I had drug companies coming in saying, oh, here, prescribe this. But I do know they did. Um, they have deep pockets. They continue to have very deep pockets. Um, I don't know, you know, and they continue to lobby in such ways that we haven't been able to price control there, you know, in the same way that we can't with insurance companies. You know, when they try to, you know, scream poverty about the health exchanges when they have CEOs making disgusting amounts of money and profits and shareholders, I, really? Yeah. If a friend tries to give you something to take, don't do it. Just, just think inside yourself that some of you, that first pill is, is going to be all it's going to take, that your brain is going to take it, and you're going to be addicted forever and be hooked, and that's it. And it really is that simple. Um, and, and it's such a tragedy. And, and I've seen too many lives ruined. Don't go there. My training is in clinical pastoral counseling. That said, I do not believe in religion-based treatment. I do believe all healing is, has a, a spiritual component. 
Um, and I think that it's my place to help a person find that for themselves. It's not something I would impose on somebody. A lot of my people that I work with don't even know that I have that as like the basis of my um, training and basis of my my beliefs, and it guides me. I think I think all all methods have a certain amount of of healing work done. Both work. It's it's different strokes for different folks, and I think the the, the important thing is to stay open to any path and whatever works go for it. Well I've been working with Healthy Acadia which is a community-based uh, action um, organization and we together we put together you know community forums all over the all over the county so the first one was at WA which was uh, my starting and then helping but we were able to get all kinds of people to come to that one, which is great. And since then, we've had multiple ones after that, um, which have gotten more structured. And uh, we've really got a good list together of people that want to help, which is what it's all about, really. These, these forums are supposed to be about action. We have, uh, we have suboxone treatment. We have... Uh, you know, substance abuse treatment, we have prevention, we have education, we have law enforcement, they've, they've all been a part of it, uh, right from the get-go, so right from the very first one, which has been awesome. You know, it's, um, unfortunately, treatment, no matter what it is, there's not a huge success rate, if you look at the statistics, no matter what treatment it is. Um, so anybody that can say they made it out, I don't think it matters what treatment they used, um, as long as it worked for them. Um, I'm Mackenzie Preston, I'm 13, and my grade is 8th grade. I want to be a surgeon, but on the side I want to be an artist, like a cartoonist. A <laughs> baller. There's nothing wrong with being a bowler. <laughs> Tell me more about bowling. A baller. Oh. B A. I thought you said a bowler. I was proud of you. I thought you were going to be a really good bowler. So pretty good. So yeah. I, so you're going to be yeah. that. Yeah. Any other ideas in case that falls through? Um, probably telemarketer, so I can just think like, annoy people. <laughs> I'll call that guy a lot. Well, short Sean. You guys already know him. Okay. Uh, my name is Sean, and you can yeah. I'm Sean. Or short Sean, if you don't care. Okay. Oh, um, yeah, a little bit. My, um, friend, um, his friends were doing weed and... Just, um, play outside. Anything outside. Or watch TV. It's not too close. It'd probably be a couple years before you start hearing about it. You would say, um, no, I don't want to. I would like to play in the NBA, but if that doesn't go through, I'll probably go to like a community college, and then you can do like NBA commentating stuff. Um, I like to play basketball and play video games. Not yet. Like probably in a couple of years it will, but as of now, not. Be an engineer. Well, if a friend tries to give it to me, I ask the question: Are they really a friend? Because that stuff is bad, and it can really ruin your life. It's not really close to me, but I know it's around. Just be my attitude, just keep telling myself not to. Oh, Opa. Hang on, come here, come here. Go oh, ahead, show me how to do. Turkey! Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> Turkey star rolls! Yeah, give me a little bit. What guy's name was that? All right, Sean, do the Star Wars, ready? Eleven you know what we should do? Look, Five years from now, look. we should meet here to make sure you're all four of you are okay. Yeah, let's do it. In the office. Come by Principal Maker's office, right? I'll film you again. Five years from now, eleven... What is it? Sixteen? We'll be, we'll be... It'll be eleven, fifteen, twenty-one. Uh, yeah. Eleven, fifteen, twenty-one. So we'll I'll, I'll say it so you remember. Wait, we'll be Get seniors and he'll be a freshman, right? No, we wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> all right.
Fuck. Now you're all gonna be oh, 11, 15, oh. 21. Oh, I'm right. so good. 21? All together. 11, 11, 15, 15 21. 21. 21. You're gonna get together and you make sure you're all okay, right? Yeah. yeah. It's a deal. Us three. Except next time I'll bring snacks. Since really? I know, since I know who you are. Next, well, five years okay. from now I can save up for snacks. Yes. Don't worry. I can't even add it. You know what? What's not plus 10? money and you get to the point where you've got to be able to survive somehow and the way you survive is by selling them two, three, four, five, six, ten pills, whatever. And I can actually sit here and say that I even asked God about it. So is this the right thing for me to be doing? Uh, I need to be able to have oil for my house. I gotta survive here somehow. I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm not saying it's indifferent, I'm just saying that sometimes, and I, don't get me wrong, there's probably people out there just sell for the heck of selling, you know, but in my case it was, I was, had to be survived, period, and less than a thousand dollars a month, so security coming in doesn't go very far, as, as anybody would know, no, so, but. anyways, what else do you want? <laughs> Well, when you get first offense for selling uh, drugs, it's, you become a felon. And once you become a felon, you might as well hang it up because you're not going to get a job at McDonald's, let alone any place else. You're out there on the street trying to survive, doing copy work, doing whatever you can do in order to survive. And guess what? Then you're right back into it again because you can't survive. And that's what's happened to all these young people, 18 years old, 19 years old. I'm, I was very fortunate. I'm, I was at the age I was at when this took place with me because it didn't really affect me too bad. So thank God for that. Because, But yeah, I mean, you'd be... What can you do if you can't get a job? Well, guess what? You're going to go right back to showing again because you have no choice in that. Project HOPE is a program that allows people who have drug addiction problems to kind of get a, a, a pass to come into a local police station. Uh, right now, uh, Ellsworth Police uh, in uh, Ellsworth, Maine, in, in Hancock County, has instituted the program. And it allows people to come in and basically turn in their drugs and seek help. And 
what happens is they will be referred to whatever type of treatment options are available for them. Uh, and the, the program actually goes a, a step beyond the normal programs in that they actively seek out whatever the best um, option for these folks uh, is in terms of treatment. They'll find them a bed somewhere if they need inpatient treatment. They'll, they'll get them in touch with counselors with whatever services are needed. The first week I was in Ellsworth, we had two overdose deaths. I was at one of them. I watched the victim laying there on the floor and I said, I gotta, I gotta um, get this you know, program going because you know, people are dying. What we're hoping is that by trying these different alternative methods, uh, you know, intervening with people earlier in the process, um, keeping them outside of the criminal justice system, that maybe that's going to help. The people that are using it and the people that are addicted, um, you know, they need help. And I think working together with law enforcement takes away some of the stigma that is associated with addiction. Because what's happening is if somebody brings in drugs to the police station, they're in possession of an illegal substance and they're committing a crime. And the police, uh, through this program, have um, kind of given them an, an out. If they're coming in, they're turning over these drugs and, and seeking help, we're saying we're not going to prosecute you. We just started the project two weeks ago. We've only had one person come in so far. But the person that came in was 20 years old, had been on drugs since age 12, heroin since around age 14. And, you know, I sat there with the person and I told them I was so proud of them to come in to a police station. And, you know, I was kind of joking around and I said, can you believe that you came in to get help and you came in to get help from a bunch of cops? So, you think that would have happened a year ago or five years ago? No way. So, you know, I think, you know, we're going to treat everybody one at a time and we're going to grow the program and do the best we can. Personally, um, well, I have a brother who is uh, uh, a uh, recovering heroin addict, so it's affected my family tremendously. It's uh, it's a very difficult uh, disease uh, for loved ones to deal with. You can see how this is like a perfect storm situation. Companies like Ortho McNeil, um, <clears throat> Merck, and some of the other big companies started making the long-acting opiates, things that you guys have probably heard about, like MS Contin or OxyContin. Those medications vary high doses very dangerous and when they first started marketing these things they I remember them coming into my residency and you know promoting these new drugs and the chance of addiction are practically zero that was not borne out so we have CMS breathing down our necks we have patients saying that they have pain we have these new medications that are supposedly safe and a lot of people get introduced to these drugs now if you look at the statistics of, of patients who are using heroin right now only about 15% of them got to heroin because they just got to heroin. Like 85% of them were using prescribed medications first. And the feds are starting to say, hey, listen, we have a problem here. You doctors got to stop prescribing all these medicines. Yeah, I know we told you to do it 10 years ago, but now we're telling you to knock it off. And so these patients who've been taking these medications or these people who've been able to get these medications in the community suddenly don't have them anymore. And when you're addicted to a powerful painkiller, it changes your brain chemistry to the extent that you will do anything, even stuff that seems like it's morally reprehensible, whether it's stealing or lying or cheating or whatever from people who mean a lot to you to get those, those medications. Well, my goal has been to try to save one person. If I save one person or we save one person, then I look at it like we just paid for it. Just in the last four years, I managed to buy a house, got a small ocean view, 
uh, two car garage. The next year, I actually bought this pickup truck, paid cash for it. And back then, you know, I wasn't uh, too broke to do any things like that. If you talk to your future self, and you can go back to right now, where you're, you know, like normal kids, yeah, right, trying to be normal kids, mm -hmm. what would you say to yourself? What would you say to yourself if you could go back and, and like you were trying to not use drugs? I would first. I would smack myself, and then I'd say, "Don't do that." Well, I'd probably just tell me that you're gonna die, like, soon, if you do drugs. So, for the first time I had um, a goal again. And so I decided to come back to school. Um, also not an easy process. Um, I was older than the typical college student with kids, um, but I wanted more for my family. I wanted more for myself. Um, but having to battle the, you're never gonna be anything because you were an addict, um, that was hard and um, I was lucky enough I had people there telling me that I could do it. And so I got into UMM and um, my life has changed so much because of it. Um, it's hard. I, um, it gave me a purpose. It gave me a social connection. Um, for the first time in a long time, I felt like I was doing something right, and I was good at it, and that meant everything. But a lot of people, you know, and, and it's a sadness to see lives that could have been something that has been lost to a drug, that, that that becomes the whole life. Intelligent people, but there's not, they're the ones that have to change it. We can't change it. I don't care how much money is put into it and how many programs, unless they want to change, it's not gonna change. To accept this call, press zero now. To decline this call, hang up.